wonderful to be here and uh, um, see all of you again. I consider all of you friends and family and people who are on this journey together. Um, and what I thought as a, uh, to set the stage for um, this meeting, um, we, are, we are in a unique uh, position uh, today now that um, the Milan Project is joining us. And I thought five years into ALD Connect and 30 years into the Milan Project, it would be good to talk a little bit about the history of both organizations and, and how and why uh, we're coming together. Um, and I will kick off with ALD Connect. Patty will then come in, and then um, I'll finish up. And, and, and uh, hopefully all this uh, that we're talking about will help explain the path we've taken but also shed light on what could come in the future. Um, so most of you have been to an ALD meeting before, but some of you have not. And so I thought it would be worth in a, just a few slides to um, describe why we started ALD Connect uh, now five years ago and what the scenario was that led to the formation of ALD Connect. Um, Essentially, we were in, in, a, in a point of time when there was you know, clearly a large unmet need, a diverse population, all bound together by this gene defect in ABCD1. So there was a common uh, um, identity here, but there were different needs um, and, and clear diversity requiring different experts different disciplines to come together. A lot of information um, in, in academia and companies was still in silos, and there was really no forum to engage across stakeholders. Um, we needed, we, we, we have separate patient organizations that really shared a mission and shared goals, but we're not um, also having a forum to speak to each other. Um, and so I think in that situation, the the very concrete scenario of newborn screening coming along, first trials and gene therapy coming along, led to the formation of, of ALD Connect um, in 2013. And so the, the, the mission really of ALD Connect was along the lines of pulling together multiple different stakeholders. This was not an organization for physicians alone. This was not an organization for patients alone. It clearly centered on the patient's plight and the patient's voice and the patient's perspective, but it wanted to really bring all talents together to serve that patient need, patient's need. Mission of our consortium, broadly improving medical care and health and outcomes for uh, patients with adrenal leukodystrophy through multiple different um, venues and, and advancing scientific knowledge, raising awareness and improving education. and. Um, who is part of ALD Connect. As I mentioned before, this is not just one group of stakeholders, but the idea was that we um, have an organization that spans multiple academic institutions. Um, we have um, uh, five institutions here uh, in the US, one in Amsterdam, but we feel like there are many uh, kindred spirits and other um, institutions that are uh, working with us, patient advocacy organizations that were either part of um, uh, active ALD advocacy or affiliated and, and, and feeling that there was, again, a shared space. So just for those of you who don't know ALD Connect, to explain how um, uh, some of the operations work and central to this is the ALD Connect uh, Board of Directors. Um, it's again a, a, a mixed forum of physicians, scientists, and patients. Um, and uh, I want to at this point actually call out uh, Kathleen O'Sullivan Fortin who's really over the past year been the person. She's probably stepped out again to do some work because she's been the one who's really done a lot of the heavy lifting. And um, although she's absent here, I do want to have a round of applause for her. <laughs> so 
she's hopefully hearing this. <laughs> this was our big gratitude to you, Kathleen, for what you've done in the past year, and we, we wouldn't be here today without you. So, um, short history of ALD Connect before I let Patty step in here. You, you know, we've, uh, we had a startup phase at first meeting in 2013. We really got off to a running start with funding fr from PCORI to form a patient-powered research network. We were only one of 18 across uh, all of biomedicine to be funded uh, for this, so we were very proud uh, to do that. Um, allowed us to incorporate, to create a board structure, to start having some organizational uh, framework. And I think then came sort of a learning phase where we recognized that despite sort of our early plans, there were difficulties in, in aligning, and in aligning uh, not just academic uh, interests, but also patient perspectives, and that actually across the patient population, there are multiple different voices and different needs, and all of those needed to be acknowledged. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, disease awareness, trial support, I think all of those things were really a um, big part of what ALD Connect was, uh, did. There were failures. We, we tried multiple times to get U01 grants and FDA um, grants that were for natural history studies. It was a, um, a multiple year process, quite frustrating. But, um, but uh, I do think we learned a lot and we worked together in thinking about outcome measures, about biomarkers. I think a very um, a big contribution came from the industry advisory board an industry advisory council that, uh, that uh, meets every two, three months and, and, and comes together and is a really a growing uh, community that is giving us feedback and input. I think in the current phase, uh, we now have first trials for AMN and a sh shared newborn screening experience, the collaborations with the Myelin Project and now with GLIA. We have a funded uh, multiple site uh, consortium that is aiming to bring about clinical trial readiness, particularly for AMN, and will incentivize uh, more trials in the future. And we're particularly excited to have a new executive director who I'll introduce shortly. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Eichler, also known as Florian, for the welcome, and to the entire ALD Connect community for uh, giving me a space this morning to talk to you. My Journey with adrenal leukodystrophy began when my younger brother, Bobby, died mysteriously at the age of five in 1958. After an autopsy, he was posthumously diagnosed with Schilder's disease, what we would now call ALD. At that time, I had no idea how this very same disease would continue to affect my life and those of my loved ones for many years. When my brother Richard was in his late 30s, he started developing gait and balance issues. After many doctor visits, he was misdiagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Richard finally went to UCLA, and after a several-year diagnostic journey, he was diagnosed with adrenal myeloneuropathy. It was only 10 years after that diagnosis that I would lose my second brother to this dreadful disease. I wish I could say that that was the end of my journey with ALD. However, it was just the beginning. The UCLA doctor that diagnosed my brother had all three of my sons tested for the genetic defect. It was discovered that my eldest son, Michael, unfortunately inherited the ALD gene. Michael now is severely affected by the symptoms of ALD. He will be 40 years old next month. Oh, I forgot to do my slide push. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the Myelin Project was formed by Augusto and Michaela Odoni for their son Lorenzo, who suffered from ALD. He was diagnosed by Dr. Hugo Mosier at the Kennedy Krieger Institute. And I think his wife, Anne, is here with us this morning. Oh, hi, Anne. Oh. <laughs> Although not medical doctors, the Adones went on an investigative journey into the disease and developed an oil treatment called Lorenzo's oil. Their plight was characterized in the 1992 film Lorenzo's oil. 
nominated for two Academy Awards. I had the honor of first meeting Augusto at a United Leukodystrophy Foundation conference in 1987. Two years later, when he and Michaela formed the Milan Project, I was asked to join the board, along with my brother Richard, who became very dear friends of the entire Adoni family. Augusto was frustrated with the slow process of medical research and the red tape that came with it. He was troubled that researchers often did not share results of their findings with others in their field. It was out of this concern that Augusto created the Milan Project in order to fund research and require the sharing of, and collaboration of those findings with ALD and Milan researchers. After serving on the Milan Project board for over 20 years, I was asked to take the reins as president due to Augusto's failing health. It was then we began to expand the objectives of the organization to include advocacy, awareness, and directly supporting low-income ALD families with financial assistance. When Florian asked me to put four or five slides together about the 30-year history of the Milan Project, I felt a little overwhelmed. But this is our best try at that. As I said, in 1989, the Milan Project was formed. 1990, the Schwann Cell Transplantation at Yale University was the first major research project funded by the Milan Project. Coincidentally, we were contacted several months ago by a researcher who thanked us for this research experiment. I'd like to read you a quote from this researcher, Dr. George Quintero, from the Brain Restoration Center at the University of Kentucky. Your support for the pioneering project on Schwann cell transplantation helped lay the foundation for our studies using peripheral nerve grafts to the central nervous system in patients with Parkinson's disease. We have benefited from the safety and feasibility findings that were established with the transplant study in a way that the Milan Project may not have originally intended. 1992, Lorenzo's Oil Film was released, receiving two Academy Awards of as I, uh, nominations, not awards, only nominations. This is when ALD had its moment in the sun, so to speak. To date, the Milan Project has sent Lorenzo's Oil's DVDs to one, over 1,000 schools across the United States to include in teachers' biology classes. 2008, our local family fundraiser raised $350,000 in just one evening. It was then I realized not only how nice it is to have wealthy and very generous friends, but also where I could be best utilized in fundraising. 2014, newborn screening in California, this is quite possibly our most impactful accomplishment. Thanks to help and guidance from the ALJ community, especially Elisa Seeger in New York and Jean Kelly in Connecticut, who's not able to be here today, Dr. Van Heeren, Janice Sherwood, and many others. California State Assembly Bill 1559 was passed into law with unanimous bipartisan support. The testimony process during the committee hearings in Sacramento was something that touched the hearts of every legislator in attendance. It is something that I will not soon forget. Thanks to our efforts, every child born in California is now screened for ALD, and hopefully no child will have to endure what far too many of us here today have had to live with. 2016, our family support program was launched. After supporting various research projects for nearly 25 years, it was decided by our board of directors that we could be making more of a direct impact on the ALD community. We launched the family support program to provide financial assistance to low-income leukodystrophy families. Over three years, the Milan Project has assisted more than 30 families with over $50,000 in direct support to help with living expenses, 
travel scholarships, medical procedures not covered by health insurance. 2019, the merger with ALD Connect. The Adoni's founding principle was to improve the lives of ALD patients through the advancement of scientific research and collaboration. ALD Connect shares that same vision of the Milan Project. Rather than continuing to duplicate efforts, the Milan Project's board of directors decided after 30 years of work that our mission could best be achieved by joining forces with a like-minded organization to combine our efforts and resources to better the lives of the ALD community. A quote from Friedrich von Schiller, even the weak become strong when they are united. Although it has been extremely difficult to say goodbye to the Milan Project, we see this as a new beginning. We are thrilled to be a part of the ALD Connect community, a tremendously devoted group of medical and clinical professionals, patients, their families, and caregivers. In closing, I'd like to acknowledge my son, Greg Benton, for his 10 years of dedication and service to the Milan Project. Our entire board of directors, several of whom are here today, Janice Sherwood, and where's Justin? There's Justin. <laughs> I very much look forward to our combined efforts as well, well at, as to a future where no one person has to needlessly suffer from a disease that has, I forgot the, my last page. Anyway, thank you all very, very much for your attention and for your welcome. Hard act to follow. Um, but I think the theme you're hearing is one of de dedication, compassion, activism. And this is very much in the spirit of ALD Connect and something we want to absorb and continue and, and, uh, and, and share with you. And I'm very happy that uh, both Patty and Greg have now joined our board of directors. And I think that's uh, one, one way that, um, that this history and your experience um, will, will live on here. So what I thought I would just do briefly um, to uh, talk about uh, mission and, and how to work together is to describe what progress we've witnessed in the last five years. And um, all of these things ALD Connect has been part of but not carried alone. And this is part of what we on our, on our board are also uh, wrestling with, this whole concept of how do we act as facilitators? What, uh, what is the role of ALD Connect in this very diverse environment, very rich environment, where it requires um, really multiple uh, dimensions of, of progress? Um, so clearly uh, what Elisa Seeger has done in, uh, new, with newborn screening and, uh, the, and together with many others, and Ann Moser's work, obviously, too many people here to mention um, what has been a milestone. We've had the first ex vivo gene therapy trial for childhood cerebral ALD, uh, patient learning academies, community calls within ALD Connect, first international multicenter trial for AMN that we'll hear about a little later um, uh, with MIN 102, our industry advisory council, um, and now more recently, newborn screening implemented in the Netherlands, um, trial readiness for the leukodystrophies and AMN. We'll hear this uh, morning from Adeline Vandiver about <clears throat> the GLIA consortium grant um, that uh, recently got funded and will allow us really to expand <clears throat> a trial network, new model systems, um, and things coming up for a scientific meeting on women with ALD in Luxembourg. That I'm, very excited about that uh, European Leukodystrophy Association is organizing, and um, we already talked about the Milan Project joining. So just to highlight briefly, I didn't actually update this newborn screening landscape, which there are already, uh, since last year, more uh, states are rolling out with newborn screening, but really just to give a kudos here to 
um, uh, Lisa Seeger and, and, and many others who were uh, uh, depicted here who made this happen. Um, our gene therapy trial, I think, is being seen as, uh, as another milestone um, in the field of ALD. But I think uh, it is important to remember that it only serves a very small segment of the patient population. And w what I think we're um, discussing more and more that it's important uh, while we celebrate this to um, be aware of the many needs across uh, the population of ALD and, and to correct uh, the false impression that this disease has now been cured which it hasn't been. There are many other aspects of ALD, apart from cerebral ALD, that need to be addressed. Um, we've had patient learning academies within ALD Connect, which I think are very much of the, the core of, of what ALD Connect is about. The idea is that we are not just uh, here as experts or scientists to uh, lecture patients about the disease, but we want to hear back from patients and families about their experience with the disease and understand what the needs are that we are not addressing. And I think there's a very important exchange between um, uh, patients, families, and uh, physician scientists happening, uh, us passing on why it takes so long to get a drug approved, what the regulatory hurdles are, why we conduct clinical trials, and, and, and in turn, understanding um, patient perspective, patient um, reported outcomes, helping us accel accelerate um, the process as we move forward. Um, you will hear more about newborn screening and our, our fabulous collaborators in Netherlands, but just to um, um, a shout out to them for really having accomplished uh, newborn screening in, in, in Europe as the first uh, uh, country there. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's really, Another heavy lift, but uh, it, it couldn't have happened, uh, you know, w without this fantastic group. Um, a, a few words about uh, our industry advisory council, which I think is another very unique aspect of ALD Connect. We decided that when when we started ALD Connect, we wanted to have all stakeholders join here, and that meant not just physician scientists and patient advocates, but also industry. Um, and the um, idea here is that there are important complementary um, fields of knowledge. Companies understand how to interact with the regulators. They understand um, uh, how, how to um, provide the drug manufacturing knowledge. Um, and, and on the other hand, companies need access to patients, resources, and knowledge to build relationships with different um, experts and sites. Um, and so I think our industry advisory council that um, meets every two, three months is a place where we usually first hear about a patient's story. And that patient story really beautifully sets the stage for um, the unmet need that's in the room. And then we usually have talks around topics that are in a pre-competitive space, whether it's biomarkers, whether it's outcome measures, and we try to think together how to address common challenges. And, and um, I think the biggest yield has been that it has really allowed more companies to step into the space and feel uh, that there is a, a, a community that, that uh, can be, um, that is motivated and, and easy to work with. And we want to uh, attract um, new companies to address the many different facets of ALD. So again, the slide I used from last year, we not only has this AMN trial of MIN-102 reached recruitment goals, but it's actually uh, coming to an end in the two-year process. And I think in, in, uh, in Europe and Amsterdam and, and, and uh, Germany, um, there are already reaching by the end of the year, uh, the end of this two-year trial. It's a double-blinded trial, so we don't know outcomes. And in the US, we will be seeing the end of this trial uh, next year. So we're very excited about the fact that this actually got off the ground and, and big kudos here to Uwe Maya and others who were a big part of uh, making this happen. But this was again, a very collaborative effort with ALD Connect. 
Um, just briefly to highlight new model systems, I think it's very important for us to keep an eye on, on continued progress in basic sciences. And, uh, you know, Josh Bunkowski having developed new model systems, we should encourage that. And shout out to future work that will be coming uh, from Vivi Heine. Um, but I just think this is another part that we, uh, as ALD Connect, should encourage, should incentivize. It's not something that ALD Connect itself does, but I do think it provides a forum where we can discuss what is needed and what future possibilities of these new technologies are, and also what is missing. What should we be developing? What should we be encouraging, incentivizing, maybe collaboratively uh, um, funding, um, or at least um, pointing and raising awareness around the needs here? The Global Lucas Free Initiative, I just saw Adeline Vandiver come in the room, so thanks so much for uh, flying in and taking the time. And she will talk to us a little bit later about uh, this initiative, a clinical trial network uh, that reaches across leukodystrophies. It's, it's um, a, a unique um, form and platform that uh, um, Reedy Adeline um, helped uh, uh, create. Um, we had for, for many years tried to do this for AMN, uh, together with um, Ali, Josh, many others um, here in the room. But it was really through Adeline's help that we got uh, the AGLIA grant now funded and that an AMN uh, trial readiness is a, is a big part of this, uh, this um, proposal. And I think it's going to allow us to develop outcome measures to define disease progression over time. And this will invite new collaborators and, uh, and hopefully industry over time to um, do, uh, perform more trials and make in a more efficient way so that we can really get to a cure for this disease. So what is missing? Where do we go from here? This is just to highlight that really this disease does not just consist of a small uh, margin of, of patients in cerebral ALD that are uh, fitting inclusion criteria for a current trial. Right now, what we really see uh, as the only sweet spot is this uh, early childhood cerebral ALD with contrast enhancement where we do bone marrow transplantation, we do gene therapy, but there's many other parts of this. And, and I think we need to understand that we have to treat adrenal myelinopathy, we have to treat adult cerebral ALD, we have to think about pre-symptomatic uh, children, uh, what is happening early after that newborn screening phase, and, and how to engage, how to also think about communicating this to new families. I think uh, we have to start thinking more about women. We've completely neglected women uh, over the past uh, few decades in ALD, and I, I think we have provided clinical care, but it hasn't entered the research realm in the same way that it should. We have to understand that really there is not, uh, myelopathy occurring here similar to men, but there are other aspects of, of, of women that are really very poorly understood, and we're just starting to wrap our head, uh, head around movement disorders and other aspects of, of, uh, that affect women. So we need more understanding and new treatment. Ultimately, I think a disease does not just affect a single person, it affects an entire family, it affects a community, and we should not treat just a single body, we should treat a community and a family as a whole. We have to understand the repercussion of treatment is not just upon uh, the individual, but it affects everybody in the family, and, and there is a great power in that. I think to harness that and understand how we uh, can encourage families to support each other, to understand despite differences and different needs, there is uh, this community uh, and, and family sense that allows for mutual understanding, right? Um, together, families can educate the public to, um, and they also can do wonderful fundraising as uh, Franny Broussard just recently showed. So I think these are all wonderful opportunities that we should expand upon. What gaps lie ahead? What should we address in the coming year? I think this is all subject to discussion and something we uh, discussed yesterday on the, in our board meeting. Clearly, there are many un unmet needs. Um, how to optimize monitoring after newborn screening, how to standardize care guidelines. There are disparities in access to diagnosis, uh, not just to treatment. Are we really appropriately uh, diagnosing all patients? 
uh, the disparities across the world that we're not um, acknowledging. We need treatments for women, um, biomarkers around relevant mechanisms, regulatory input and feedback. And I think we've not really done enough in terms of advocacy at NIH itself. And that's been a, a big gap. Uh, there are many of the those councils need to hear from you, need to hear your voice to say NIH and tax dollars need to support research in ALD. Um, ultimately, the goal here is to incentivize new treatments and trials. So I think one thing I'm particularly concerned about as we move forward is that with growth and progress, uh, we are recognizing that disparities may increase. So um, while some benefit, many people do not. And I think it's something to keep in mind. We've clearly seen an incredible growth in our clinic here at MGH, where uh, numbers have doubled over the past five years. And we're seeing patients from all over the world. And as those trials come to an end and we have approved drugs, I worry about what's going to happen to those patients. And I think as, as a community, we should recognize these are our brothers and sisters affected by the disease around the world. And um, we don't want to become boutique medicine. We want to really serve the global community. So an important moment for us. We have a new executive director. Where is Kelly? So a big welcome to uh, Kelly Miatnan. <laughs> So uh, needless to say, we're very excited about this. And you, don't, you have the uh, small task of pulling all these different threads together that I mentioned. And uh, she already did a wonderful job yesterday at our first, uh, the first board meeting she attended to, to highlight all the different perspectives in the room and the many different needs and identify goals together. But this diverse community, I think, is a real um, opportunity uh, to bring progress about. And we can really, uh, uh, by aligning do so much um, and it is a bit of a challenge to understand the landscape but it's it's worth every minute so i just wanted to end on that note and uh, and thank everybody who's been part of this thank you